Okay, great. All right. So I'm just like holding it so I can see the chat. Okay. It pops up. You know. Okay, great. Got a lot going on in two okay. little screens. All right. Thank you. So without further ado. Hello, everybody. Welcome to me. <laughs> um, today, I'd like to just kind of talk through a lot of what I've done over the last several years. I don't think I've given a presentation to the EOHS community since I interviewed for my job. So maybe this is a good time to like kind of give you all an update on, on where we're at and what's happened. And since then, uh, COVID, COVID happened. So I think people are a lot more aware of when I say a respirator, they don't think of a ventilator in like a hospital. They think of like what a respirator is. Um, and it's just brought a lot of uh, interesting things that we've been doing since uh, in the last several years. So without further ado, I present to you Cough, cough, panic, aerosol exposures and control in healthcare settings. Thank you, Dr. Bonnie, for my catchy title. <laughs> so a lot of my research can be divided sort of into two um, main areas, all sort of centrally focused. And I've been doing, a, I've done a few right research projects where I'm looking at aerosol measurement and exposures. And so I'm gonna kind of highlight a couple of those projects and talk about what we've done. So uh, when COVID happened, we were able to get some money pretty quickly to do uh, some sampling in the hospital. And uh, a lot of other people were also doing this. We were only really looking we to, to uh, sample for live virus is incredibly difficult. It has, it, it's just got a lot of problems that can be really challenging to address without the appropriate sampling equipment. And even if you have the appropriate sampling equipment, it's still very, you're still not going to get all of what it might be in the environment. So we were just really looking for like RNA. And what this means is we were setting up samplers and we were then collecting uh, air from nurses, from patient bedsides, from different areas in the room, which I will describe just kind of detect like, you know, what are the controls? And the, the problem that the hospital really came up with early on is that they were putting a lot of people on high flow nasal cannulas. And what that means is it's just a nasal cannula, especially kind of nasal cannula that's like really blasting a, a high flow rate of clean air into these people's lungs. And the recommendations were that respiratory protection needed to be preserved for people who were on aerosol generating procedures. This like a uh, term that people who work in healthcare might be familiar with, but there's no real definition of what an aerosol, what generates aerosols. We like know maybe bronchoscopies, intubation are all um, definite aerosol generating procedures, but then something like toilet flushing or changing bed sheets, we know from literature might also generate aerosols. And so it's like, how do you, determine what is an aerosol generating procedure. And so we set this up where we were gonna look at patients who were admitted for, with COVID uh, and then distinguish by what the type of oxygen treatment they were on. So maybe some people were intubated, some people were receiving high flow nasal cannulas, some people were receiving low flow nasal cannulas and others just maybe were on room air or like maybe about to go home. And this was kind of set up at the onset of the COVID, COVID pandemic. So we did this, uh, I mean, the onset of COVID pandemic, by the time we get up and running and got IRB approval and figured out all of our logistics, it's December of 2020, um, about a week after my daughter was born. So I wasn't actually even in the hospital sampling, but my team was, uh, and we had, we ended up getting about 57 patients who were admitted with confirmed COVID, and then we also, at the same time, we sampled, I will show you on this next slide where we sampled. So we put in like, right, we do, drew a schematic of every patient room. If the patient is here, we put what we would call a near field sampler right next to their bedside. All right. And then we had this other rule. Remember the like six feet rule or, you know, if you're more than six feet away, it's like no, no big dish, no big deal. So we also set up what we call a far field sampler that was like a little bit further away. Um, and then we, and off this was, we put this on the windowsill, just like across the room in their room. We took note if their room had a HEPA filter, because we know that adding purifying things uh, in patient rooms might have reduced 
uh, the ability to detect COVID. This is like a tr very traditional IH pump. We connected that IH pump. So this is what we use to sample. We put one on the nurse who was going in and out of multiple patient rooms. We put one uh, of these pumps with a, just a plain filter in the near field, one in the far field. And we sampled for about three to four hours at like just two and a half liters a minute, which is kind of a standard way to sample. Um, uh, again, during all of this, you know, there was no right answer. We didn't know like how long should we sample? What flow rates? Like there's no standardized procedure for how to do this. So we were just kind of making it up as we went along and like reading literature as it came out. So we just then what happens is we collected all these, we send them to a lab for analysis. The lab degrades the filter, condenses the particulate, sends it through PCR analysis, and we got back the results. The other thing that we did, um, and oh, this is like how we sampled, we put everything in a backpack on the healthcare practitioner. And then we also had this instrument. So the, those were the SKC samplers. We also had an instrument called the WRPAS. It's a new instrument that we have that counts really fine, ultra fine particles. Um, and it's, it's miniature. And so we put that in their backpack. And the idea was that if we could see particle counts every second of every day that the healthcare worker was doing, um, then we would be able to like know like if they're next to the patient's breathing space, are they being exposed to more particles from those high flow nasal cannula type things? Okay, so this instrument just counts um, every second data and it logs it. But the problem with, if you just have an instrument that's logging data is you also need a human that follows that healthcare worker and watches uh, what they do at every second and writes down, you know, at 12.02, they were in the room doing X. They were giving medicines. They were doing whatever they were doing. Um, so those were the ways in which we sampled. And I see that uh, Hamed has entered the room and he did all this work. So thanks to Hamed for sitting in the hospital rooms and, uh, you know, uh, consenting patients who were uh, intubated and difficult to consent uh, and recording all of these data. So the first result I'm going to give you from this project were to look at that this real-time particle concentrations. And this is going to lead into at the very end of my talk, I'm also using this instrument for another task. So you'll be able to see this, the, the, the continued problems where we describe this. So this would be like one example of like what this person's exposure might look like every second of every, you know, of the three hours that we shifted in this mode. It looks like it's just, um, and so here we know like maybe they were doing vitals where they're maybe like leaning over and doing things. And like, this is just a random spike, but this data could be very messy. And at the end of the day, we couldn't really see very many trends. The trend that we see like most clearly to us is that every time they go into the room, it seems like there's a little spike. And what we think is happening is they're throwing on their hospital gowns, they're throwing on their PPE, and that's generating particles right up in their space. So they that was like what what that was the exposure, and not necessarily because they were leaning over a patient who was on a high flow nasal cannula. Um, so then the other results from this project. Uh, we just kind of dichotomize this, whether or not we combined the near and far field samples because there were actually very few samples that turned out to be positive. So we kind of just dichotomized it by whether or not you had the air, any air sample in the room was negative for COVID versus any air sample in the room was positive for COVID. And we looked at kind of a lot of these demographic features, how long were they in the hospital, you know, uh, and who we recruited changed throughout the project. Uh, you know, at the beginning, it was anyone who was there for COVID, but then maybe those people had been there for two months and like the COVID was gone, but the lingering health effects were still there. And that's why they were in the hospital. So we tried to get people like as they were being admitted. Um, so we have this like length of hospital stay, time from system to onset. This is like really maybe interesting, uh, but if they're rapid, so we also took nasal swabs and if their nasal swab was negative, 
it was unlikely that we were going to find COVID in their room. Another confounder to all this that couldn't really get sorted out is that uh, oftentimes there's we were uh, putting multiple people in one room and maybe only one person consented to be in our study. So like there was, you can imagine there was just like a lot of very moving parts in this, but so this was just sort of one of the things that we did, but if it, if it was negative, we found that, you know, the air samples in general were negative. And then this was not, these were not necessarily statistically significant, but I would say that if there was a HEPA filter in the room, it was less likely that we were going to find COVID in that room. And so what happens then is when you get to the treatment section is, uh, you see that like kind of contrary to what we would believe, because we believe like intubation is in, you know, the, that th these people would have the highest number of air samples that would be positive in this intubation category. But what, but we didn't really see that. And the reason that we think that is, is that the hospital didn't have HEPA filters in every room. They didn't have sufficient HEPA filters to do that. So they prioritized putting HEPA filters in the rooms where they thought they were going to be the most likely exposures, which meant that almost every person who was intubated also had a HEPA filter. So we think that that's sort of what went on in this study. So that's one thing I did. Um, the next sort of aerosol sampling I did with regards to COVID was that uh, we we recognized that respiratory protection usage really skyrocketed during COVID. And I don't know what this is or whose this is, but uh, this is just not a respirator. But these respirators that are preformed, so you've all seen like those cup shaped respirators, uh, anything that's preformed is being held together by some underlying mechanisms comprised of plastic. And so I have a colleague in the school of medicine who was like, you know, if we're exposing people to these respirators, they're, we're telling them they have to wear them all day long. Like we've got a phthalate exposure, you know, an increased exposure of phthalates. And when we dug into the literature, some people had already like taken respirators and sent the entire respirator to analysis for phthalates and did find like a series of phthalates in the respirators. And so we were like, let's collect some pilot data to see if humans are being exposed from what's supposed to be protecting them. Cause you know, you solve one problem by creating another. And so the idea was to see if humans could be exposed to phthalates. And then we also had a simultaneous study like with where people were, we were, at, we were collecting urine after people wore a respirator all day long versus a surgical mask versus nothing to kind of, decide if this was uh, the case. And the results of this are like pending. So I'll just tell you how I set up the lab because this was sort of an interesting problem. Um, we didn't want, when you're thinking about phthalates, it could be really uh, very person specific. So I wanted to know like, let's take the pe person out of this equation. And the first thing I wanted to do was to uh, figure out how I could measure, you know, as if someone were breathing without buying a really hundreds of thousands of dollars breathing machine. Like if someone is breathing, what would that look like? So I set up, we have a huge room size exposure chamber. And the idea was that if I could make this exposure chamber, like at least 70% humidity and 32 degrees Celsius, like uh, a, a resembling exhaled breath just the entire room would be hot and humid. And then I would pull air from that room through a respirator onto a filter. And then I could analyze those filters for phthalates. Okay, so the way that we set this up was we had the room vacuum. And so we pulled air, we measured the flow rate and we got it to like 20 liters a minute so that we could be simulating again, like a human at hard work rates. Uh, we pulled it through the filter and then it goes to the back of the board, like a wooden board. Again, we had to avoid plastics in the sampling line. So we had like plastics and whatnot. And we put the we put the respirator on the front of this wooden board and we would just pull air through the respirator, but the air that we pulled would be really hot and humid to simulate human breath. Um, 
I know that this is really exciting, but the results of this are TBD. Yeah, we had to use Tygon tubing, which is plastic, but I'm hoping that the very short distance of Tygon tubing between the board and the filter, which would be the first element in that sampling line, would did not cause extra phthalate to land on that filter. We did not. This is a very preliminary study. But if you would like to take this study further, Marcos, in your three months left in your career here, you just let me know. <laughs> um, we uh, did apply for a larger grant to continue studying this. You said the chamber is room size? Oh, yeah. It's like the size of a bedroom. Why does it need that size? It doesn't. Do you have a big box? If you had a big box, we could do that. But uh, yeah, we could use a big box. The exposure chamber that we have that's a large box is a big plastic box. Um, so I didn't have a big wooden box readily available to do this with. And also getting hot and humid air, like how uh, is a different challenge when it's a really small space. You know, I'd have to pump, I'd have to pump air in, you know, which is possible, which is not how we did it. Yes, Gabby. Well, if people want a tour of the room, we can go over and see the room. Yeah, we can go see it. in a lab over in SPH lab. Gabby, do you have a question? Yeah. So we're right, we're right How much impact did that your study? Oh, this study happened like in the last year. That's why the results are pending. The first study didn't have to be adapted because we were working with the hospital. Except that we were like, they were like, you don't really need respiratory protection to be on these COVID floors. And we were like, we do. <laughs> um, you know, because that we wouldn't necessarily have been prioritized for respirators, but Hamed was prioritized for COVID vaccine. All right, so that's sort of the aerosol work that I'm for. Oh, yes, Hashma. This filter, we, fill, we exposed it for 24 hours to really try and see, because like that would be like our worst case scenario. Um, the the delay on this these results is really um, the analytical methods used in the lab and making sure that they're um, fine tuned enough to actually give us the data that we're looking for. And that's not my area of expertise, but they are working on it. Last I checked. So then, what people know me for more broadly is my area of expertise, which is respirators. And I'm going to like really just take this moment to like sit on my soapbox. And I, I assume most of you have heard my soapbox. And if you haven't, I'm taking this opportunity to enlighten you. What do you call these? N95s. And I'm so sick of people saying that. <laughs> uh, this is my personal vendetta. An N95 is a filter type. And uh, so we, like in respirator world, refer to these as filtering face piece respirators, where the entire face piece is the filter. So it's just kind of this, like, if you're going to work in respirators or think about them, like, I just had to go through a paper that was published and all they did was talk about N95s. And then, I'm not going to give up on it. I'm not going to give up on it. And I will just preach it. <laughs> a filtering face piece respirator, FFR. All right. So importantly, NIOSH certifies. Wait, wait, wait. I want to ask. So what is the harm of people calling them N95 masks? Why is that? Oh, not oh my gosh. You just they're said all masks. the, they're definitely not masks. <laughs> they're respirators. A mask is something that does not provide respiratory protection. A respirator by definition provides. Put, can, can provide respiratory protection or has been certified to provide respiratory protection. We're gonna get into the nuances of this in the next 25 minutes. <laughs> All right, so NIOSH certifies filters, but in order for a respirator to provide you, the user with respiratory protection, not only does the filter have to like meet very strict filtration requirements, it also has to seal to your face. Um, I like to remind people that like air is just like any liquid and it's going to take the path of least resistance. So if you have a really great filter and this was uh, 
every KN95 mask would fit this bill, you could have a really great filter, right? The KN95 masks are, they meet the Chinese equivalent of the NIOSH certification standards for N95 filters. But if it doesn't seal to your face, it's gonna provide you essentially no protection. Um, and so the way that we, me, uh, there's multiple ways to assess uh, how how that fits or how well it seals to your face. But in general, we ask subjects to do what's called a fit test where they perform some combination of these exercises in general. Uh, when we talk about condon, when we talk about quantitative fit testing, it's a it's a way to determine uh, quantitatively and objectively if that respirator is sealing to the face. And so how it does it is it counts how many particles are on the inside of the mask and it compares it to how many particles are on the outside of the mask um, for doing all these kind of head motions. All right, so now let's say you have a mask, a respirator that has been certified by NIOSH, the filter media, and you've gone through your annual one time a year fit testing making sure that that respirator fits to your face, does that mean that you're going to be protected while you're at work doing your job? It's like unclear at this point. The world really just does not know this information. We have, we make a giant assumption that if you pass your fit test, that every time you put that respirator on when you're at work, that you're putting it on so that it's protecting you. Um, the way that we would be able to determine this is to do some sort of what we would call a workplace protection factor study, where we're actually going out into workplaces and measuring how well is that respirator protecting you at the point of use while you're doing your job. But even then, you're still just getting like single time point measurements. At this point today in the world, there's no way to determine in real time given a sensor or any other technology, if a respirator is actually protecting you while you're doing your job. And um, NIOSH currently has a challenge out for anyone who wants to try and solve that problem. Um, there's just, it's just a really tough problem to solve, as I guess is what I will leave that at. Um, and I, I can go over it a little bit, but Instead of them doing these studies in workplaces, you could set up simulated workplaces where you can kind of control a lot more of the environment. And this, these types of studies are how OSHA establishes how protective is your respirator. So if anyone has undergone fit, quantitative fit testing for a filtering face piece respirator, um, you would know that you, in order to pass that fit test, you need to have a ratio of a, a hundred fold difference between the outside particles and the inside particles. And we would call that a fit factor of 100. Um, but th those respirators, OSHA would say are only giving you a protection level of 10. So there's like a safety factor of 10 inherently built into the process. So I've done work to look at how does fit change while you're doing different types of ex exercises, because maybe just moving your head back and forth and up and down isn't reflective to like the work that people do. So we did one study where we were looking at uh, all of these types of first responders. They had to do really heavy things like run on a treadmill or carry this 80 pound mannequin across the room, go up and down ladders. Um, and so what we did, and this is kind of a best practice, I would say, is we developed a best practice way to look at simulated exercises, which is to do it in repetition, to see does fit stay consistent over time. And so what you're looking at here is the simulated workplace protection factor, which again is that uh, ratio from outside to inside. And so here we see that, um, you know, every time the sub the person bent over, we have similar drops and very specifically, we see this drop when they jog, we see that uh, protection factor come down quite a bit compared to when they're just standing still normal breathing or bending over, which are, you know, the exercises we do during our fit test. So, what is, where, how are you measuring inside? What are you measuring? Um, 
So in order to measure on the inside, what we do is we probe the respirator, we poke a hole in it, and we attach a sample line, which goes into this instrument, which is counting those particles. It said that you're on like exhaled breath state. It could. We sometimes see that during the talking exercise. Um, this instrument, when you're looking at filtering face piece respirators, counts a very specific size range that not necessarily exhaled breath would constitute. Now, you can also use this instrument to do similar projects with other types of respirators, specifically like full face pieces, in which case it would count all sized particles. All right. Um, so one option, because in order to do these studies, to get this real-time data, where is that slide with that real-time data? We actually have to have two of those instruments, one that's constantly counting the ambient particles and one that's constantly counting the inside mask particles. And so it's kind of, it's really cumbersome actually to have two very large instruments. And so TSI called me up and they said, Margaret, you know, we'd like to develop an instrument to do this project, to do what you do, but better and easier. And so they developed this instrument. I mean, I have a, a prototype of it. They've got, there's probably about 10 of them now that exist in the world. Um, and it counts like these very, like a very wide range of particles. And it can kind of be flipped in all sorts of directions. So we could actually, it only weighs one pound and it's pretty little. We could strap it onto someone's belt and sample now while someone's actually doing their job. The negative consequences of using this instrument, because if I could, could, I would apply to that NIOSH challenge and say, we have an instrument that can do this. Why don't we use it? Is that, um, like I said, the when we're using filtering face piece respirators, the challenge is that 5% of respirator particles are allowed to go through the filter by the nature of the certification standard. And you don't want to count the particles that go through the filter because those are quote unquote allowed to be there and are already accounted for in the certification process. So really what you, on, you only want to count the particles that are leaking around the face seal. And that's why we count that's why we count them in such a very narrow size range. We count them in that narrow size range because we know that the filter captures those at 100% efficiency, right? There's no 5% leaking through of that narrow size range. It's called the we we just know that through physics. So this instrument doesn't have the capacity to do that. So this instrument could really only be used if you're using anything like a P100 filter or you know, uh, increased level of respiratory protection. Would we be able to use this instrument? But we could use this in any industry that requires uh, a higher level respirator to collect more of that real time, real time data. All right, and this could have like very large reaching implications to do things with new technology. All right, so another study that we've conducted uh, is that, remember I was talking about all of the filtering face piece respirators have an assigned protection factor of 10. And, uh, the, you know, we have to re achieve a fit factor of 100 while we're doing our fit test. Now, all respirators fall into a class and OSHA establishes, you know, what is that assigned protection factor. And, uh, this company came to me and they said, you know, Margaret, we make, uh, they make, uh, if anyone can look at this they, and you have a relative or maybe you use a, a CPAP machine at home, it's the same company. And what happens is they decided they've got this really great way that they know that they can create a, this comfortable, cushy feel against your face. It's not like rigid and it, people would much prefer it. And so they went ahead and they made a, a respirator using the so, same sorts of technology. But this respirator is different because it's what would be called a quarter mask respirator. So all of your half mask respirators are assigned a protection factor of 10 and they go under your chin is where they're sealing. This respirator goes just under the lower lip. And that's where it fits. And so if it doesn't go back below the chin, it's called a quarter mask respirator. And a quarter mask respirator, based on maybe two studies in the 70s, was given an, a protection, an assigned protection factor of five. But if you hook up the 
quantitative fit testing technology and you send these subjects through a fit test, they get protection factors greater than 200. And so this company, but like healthcare institutions didn't want to implement this because in theory, OSHA is saying it's less protective than what we're already using. So this company wants to just like challenge that. And so they uh, got me and my team together and they said, you know, let's push through and uh, to conduct a study where we could look to see how well this protects people in a simulated healthcare environment. So again, I set up a, a little study where they're doing things different and like kind of really challenging, you know, the motions. And so the way we do that is like doing sheet changing where they're like kind of up and down and up and down, pushing the 80 pound mannequin. Uh, we had them doing CPR, which is like a really high intensive exercise where they're like moving their head a lot. And then we had them taking vitals and we repeated that three times. And again, we found that over the course of this study that this respirator, you know, provided even while you're challenging it, a fits greater than 150 across the board. And so what's actually happening with this study right now is that we're using the data collected from this study and we've applied to OSHA, we've applied to NIOSH, we meet with them, uh, I mean, as often as they will allow us to meet with them. And we're actually asking OSHA to change the assigned protection factor for all quarter mass respirators based on the data from this study. So we're also using, you know, my research to kind of challenge the status quo. Uh, and we understand that that process might take a really long time, but even the studies that were conducted in the seventies showed that they should have had a higher protection factor. Um, there was some other point I wanted to make on this. Whoa. Um, Maybe not. Okay. So then what I spend actually the bulk of my time doing is thinking about how we can implement reusable respirators in healthcare. So I work predominantly with uh, the National Personal Protective Technology Lab, and they're really interested in like, uh, you know, this is a, a pandemic happened. It's still happening, some would argue. But before the pandemic happened, I published this paper in 2019, and I pulled this sentence out of it because we said into, in April of 2019, before the pandemic, in the absence of evidence-based guidelines and established best practices, employers may unruly rely, unduly rely on personal protective equipment because of its wide availability and pervasiveness as a control measure. And in this paper, we argue that like we need to think beyond respirators as control measures, but I uh, looked through the literature and the data was uh, that before the pandemic, there were about 15 million filtering face piece respirators in the strategic national stockpile. And a different paper published, I don't remember the year, but Carius suggested that in like the event of a pandemic where we were gonna need a lot of resp respiratory protection, uh, we were gonna need approximately 5 billion respirators. And I think that like, so like we, Everyone knew, everyone knew that we were gonna run out of respirators in the event of pandemic. It was like pretty well established. And that's why we were working on ways to reduce respirator usage. Just so in case anyone was wondering today, the strategic national stockpile is up to 500 million. So they've increased by like, I think they say a factor of 26. Um, but you know, the difference between 15 million and 5 billion is orders of magnitude. And that's why we saw the supply chain issues that we were having. And one way that we could reduce or stop relying on that supply chain is like if we could convince healthcare institutions to use reusable respirators. Um, a lot of companies have come up with a lot of really innovative designs that would be a more amenable to respiratory protection. So what I do is I spend a lot of time working with sites and asking them to implement reusable respirators and we do like all kinds of testing on it. We do all, we ask a ton of surveys of like how comfortable was it? Did it affect your field of vision? Did it, you know, could you disinfect it in time? Do you need to disinfect it between patients or is just disinfecting it at the end of the day sufficient? We do like a lot of this. And so, um, oh, these are the sorts of things that we're asking, but um, then I'm solely responsible right now. I'm developing the implementation guidelines 
for reusable respirators for healthcare institutions at CDC slash um, NIOSH. It'll obviously come out, you know, through after the review process in, uh, when I said I was gonna have a second child, they said, no worries, your child will be walking, talking before this even sees the light of day. Um, but so I'm really working on coming up and like coming up with all of the problems and then figuring out how we can address those problems and developing guidelines that hospitals could really follow step by step in order to implement reusable health respirators in their settings. Okay, so that's the other part of what I do. Now, um, back in today's news, I guess. It doesn't go away. It's like uh, the new Cochrane Review, right? <laughs> yeah, so we're going to get to that in a second. But so the last project we did during the height of COVID was were masks helpful to reduce the spread of COVID-19? And so thinking about, if this is almost the opposite problem of fit testing, where you can measure a fit because we can create an environment with that tight seal where you can count very few particles and compare it to an ambient concentration where there's lots of particles. In order to determine if a mask is working as a source control, you would need to create that opposite environment where the outside environment has to have almost zero particles and you're counting what the person is emitting or have a way to distinguish those particles, a ton of literature came out. And I'm sure that you all read something at some point that said X double t-shirt is better than single t-shirt, uh, whatever. But like none of those studies looked at both the filtration because oftentimes it, they were looking only at the filtration capacity, right? Like when I push particles through this, it filters better than this other material, but no one was looking at filtration and fit combined. There was also a lot of like computational fluid dynamics that went into these and we saw videos of particles. But like to this day, no one, myself included, has have solved this problem. This um, the picture here is from a study. It's called the Green and Vesley method. And the Green and Vesley method, I think, came out in like the 50s where, you know, they were trying to solve this problem then. And they had a person down their surgical mask and like lean over. And then it kind of filters down into a stages impactor so that we could actually see the size distribution. And like, uh, I, I don't know the results of this, but I know that 3M built a green and Vesely chamber at the start of the pandemic and nothing ever came out of it. So like, this isn't necessarily the best way to do this. Um, again, this is like a problem that I tried to solve maybe unsuccessfully, but if anyone has an idea, I'd be more than well happy to revisit it. So the way we which we tried to solve this is that we had um, what's called a walking pod, which is like a soccer mom pod that someone can put over themselves and keep away from the rain, like a plastic environment. So I was like, if I could, if I could clean just a small space and then have someone breathe and I could count, I could connect tubes out on the outsides of this with a series of different instruments, maybe I could detect, you know, the differences between different types of respiratory protection. So here's uh, our soccer mom chamber. Um, here's the ports that we put on the outsides of it. And then we actually put this inside of another tent to further reduce the space. And then we have all our sampling instruments out here. Should we had our do a million trials of like, different ways to do this. Um, so this would be like with and without a surgical mask. And I don't even know, I, this slide is poorly designed because like the, the, the Google, the, the, the designer tool cut off my legend, but maybe we can assume that like this is without mask and this is with mask, but the differences were so small and so hard to detect that like ultimately it was decided that like, I mean, we, she got an MS out of it because she put in a substantial amount of work, but it, not, it, it was just really hard to determine. We couldn't do it in any sort of systematic way. So if anyone wants to figure this out and work with 
someone in a clean room to solve. Like it's a project I'm still really passionate about and would be more than happy to mentor someone through, but it's a challenge that has not been solved and would be grateful. The literature would be greatly enhanced if we solved it. Some of the problems were that maybe, I think that the, my MS student had few parts. She just was a low particle generator. Um, the particle counts change day to day. They change based on what you ate an hour before you come into the lab. Uh, getting in it, getting down to zero particles, even in this walking pod was like extremely challenging. She'd sit on her little stool with a personal purifying device, and then she'd have to turn the purifying device off and turn on all the sampling equipment all at the same time. So we could, <laughs> it was like the, there's logistical issues, but I think that we could address them if anyone wanted to in my like future problems to solve list. So that brings me to my final slide. The Cochrane Report thoughts. Um, I honestly have not reviewed it in great depth. Margaret, can you tell everybody what it is? Okay, yeah. So a meta analysis, and does anyone want to shed light on what is a meta analysis? A meta analysis compares a lot of other reviews and kind of combines them into one larger statistical. Um, analysis, right? Like I take, take the data from Tessa's research and the data from Joey's research. They both studied the same problem. So I'm going to combine them and then do a new statistical approach to see if, you know, what the, what the science says, if neither of those found it to be significant. And this study compared like uh, surgical masks to respirators, surgical masks to nothing at all. And essentially at the end of the day, they were like, really, it didn't make any difference. Wear whatever you want. It didn't make any difference in getting COVID. Specifically. In getting COVID, now were all the studies that went into this meta analysis a hundred percent related to COVID? They weren't. Some of them related to flu. Um, again, I I haven't had the time to review this article in depth, but I can tell you that I have yet to see a compelling argument in any paper published since COVID, one way or the other. Um. So there's a lot of bad data going into this analysis that then is I is coming out with bigger bad data, in my opinion. Um, I know that a lot of researchers have written into the Cochrane editorial and said, you know, this is problematic in a lot of ways. They call it, a lot of researchers are calling it, they like the authors subscribe to quote unquote, the dog, the droplet dogma. Where like we, you know, I think of aerosols as a, a, a pendulum of small and large particles. The droplet is like people assume that COVID is droplet and that you couldn't get it via in, inhalation. Um, so that's just my quick and dirty thoughts on the Cochrane report, but I'm happy to review it in detail or sit down with you all and we could have an entire semester long study on the, the, the studies that went into it and what's coming out of it. Yeah, that would be good because I just pulled it up. <laughs> yeah, we can. So another thing that's really important to note is that when you're looking at these studies, right, let's look at nurses. Uh, there's an author, Loeb, who does this a lot, and it's really just irritating. He says, you know, I'm going to take nurses and some of the nurses are going to wear surgical masks and some of them are going to wear respirators. And I'm going to compare the rates in which they get COVID, let's say. I think he came out with a study in the last few months. And what happens is that you're not looking at the rest of the time, right? A, let me remind you that unless that respirator is done appropriately, it's not going to protect you. It gives you protection. In fact, it goes from protecting you a hundred to less than five. Um, and in order for it to not to have zero leaks, when you pinch that nose cut, it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable it, to be like that. That that sealed. So like, this relies on healthcare workers self-reporting that they're wearing their respirators a hundred percent of the time and they're doing it up so that it's protecting them. And B. It's forgetting the fact that like they go into their lives where COVID exists <laughs> everywhere else around them. And it's, you can't, it's not, they're not taking any of those variables into consideration when they're publishing these studies are some of the major limitations. 
Yes, Sam. If, if, if that's a randomized trial, they it's should it's control for this. Yeah. So why? I mean, if, if, if I mean, we like Dr. Rivers are for randomized controlled trials. Confounding is much less of an issue than an observational, you know, simple observational study. Right. Um. I don't. I think that you're. If. If COVID were only acquired in the workplace, maybe that would be, but like your exposure, it goes beyond your workplace and you can have a hundred percent respiratory protection at work and you can step home and your child comes home and you've got COVID, right? Like there are just so many other variables that I don't think that you can, you can still get COVID without being at work is I guess what I'm saying. Tessa. I will say also that the Cochrane review, you know, starts out by saying masks and respirators made no difference, but then in their limitation section, like pages in, the limitations are like profound limitations and they say so. They just don't say it up front. So the immediate takeaway is like, you know, well, this is fine, but then they talk about adherence. They talk about um, self-report and some of those randomized control trials. And, you know, these real issues that I think are, you know, maybe should have been presented up front because the takeaways are such that. But it's, it's, it's interesting because if you just scan it right now, the results for people wearing masks in the community versus not wearing masks contracting COVID-19, that's one sort of brick set of mm -hmm. results. But there is another set of results that compares surgical masks and N95 masks. And while the confidence intervals are slightly over one, you do see a reduction in risk. It's not statistically significant, but in, in individuals wearing N95s relative to those masks. So you really have to read the whole article and know what you're reading to piece out whether this like blanket conclusion that masks don't work. Right. Because right. I read it as an epidemiologist, so I'm like, I'm still going to wear my N95 because I don't know what people were doing in the community and what happened when they- You're filtering home. face piece respirator. That? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, <Rachel. laughs> so I think it's interesting, but there's a you gotta really read that right. and yeah. know what you're reading to interpret it. And that's yeah. the problem, right? The public doesn't do that. The public, absolutely. They're reading the Sunday the Tribune. Yeah, the Cliff Notes version that's been reduced and reduced. Yes, Bob. I mean, this was really the same argument that we had back with each one as one when we were doing with Matthew Wolf, also published a uh, huge it was very controversial at the same time with the same limitations and just really ignoring those limitations. But I think you have to think of what percentage of the exposure really is occurring at work. And if it's if most of the exposure is right. not at work, then that then it, you're just not gonna be able to find a difference if we're only controlling the work that plays control of the exposure. And right. Especially with COVID, there's so much more community and home and other exposures. Um, that's really very, very difficult. And that they haven't measured, you know, that what proportion of exposure is happening at the workplace. Well, and how could you? Right. You'd have to. So it has to be really purely experimental. Totally isolate someone and tell them they have to go live in a hotel for a month, right? They did that in Australia. They did that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So moving forward, are there, are there sensors or other things that could be designed to capture this, like whether or not it's protecting you at the point of use? Yeah. Everyone is trying to, answer, there are other researchers trying to answer this question. Um, it's just really hard. So the things that I've looked at include pressure differentials, like cause we could get a pressure sensor pretty easily. Um, and we couldn't figure that out. Uh, when I first did my postdoc at NIOSH, we had this kind of a crazy kooky man, but he wanted, he set up this like, uh, radio frequency sensors, you know, like to, to nasal breath contributes. I don't know. That didn't work. We looked at like uh, using a heat map, having someone stand in front of an infrared camera. Like, could you see leakages? And even like we went pixel by pixel analyzing it, we couldn't see like anything. But I think that there might be a way if we started to mo like no one is looking at this with uh you know when i listen to what Husheng is able to do with his ai and triangulating more than one feature 
you know, he's able to like take voice, you know, pitch and diagnose diseases. Like, could we figure out a way to triangulate data to then have some way to predict with just a sensor? But I, it just isn't done yet. And like the research isn't there. I would say I'm working on it and I know um, others are also working on it, but we're, we're still struggling with how we could do that. It would be useful in lots of realms, but like I said, NIOSH currently has a challenge to solve this and it's, it would be a really hard, ch hard challenge to solve. Yes. I have two questions about the quarter math. Mm -hmm. So with the quarter math, how is like talking with that? You know, how does it say like, where it's supposed to be? Like, just, like, it just moves up and down. It's, yeah. it's sealed still, but like it just moves okay. a little bit, but like it's still totally sealed around your face. Okay. And then in the picture, it looks like it is like there's like a little bit, like a cave around the filters. And that is the, the is there a way to like, make that plastic part that is like the cage part make that out of like a more sustainable material that's not like a plastic yeah and still have that seal and then be able to just like change out that filter and then is there a way to yeah. that filter more you were talking about the sustainability the reusability of this, this well no this one can be reused really? yeah absolutely um actually all all filtering face piece respirators can be reused uh, unless it gets dirty or wet for some reason but if you think about like the effectiveness of a filter, as more things get embedded in the filter, it becomes a more efficient filter. It becomes a better filter. So yeah, so this cage just pops right off and you can put a different filter right on there. And then this, so the rest of this could all be washed and reused easily, no issues. And I assume the same with the straps too, because you can yeah. change it up. Yep. Yeah, this is one of the reusable respirators that I'm talking about. So I do a lot of work on reusable respirators in healthcare institutions and trying to figure out what those problems are, like combat supply issues and for any future implications. This might not be a good question to answer, yeah. but is there a way to use all the masks that we have been using, like disposable masks, when we're talking about respirators masks, um, are we able to take those and use those as like, like other materials and that, that can be reused? I don't know. If that You're a very sustainable that. focused person. Well, uh, yeah, I don't. It's like you could collect them and then use them for this purpose too. Would be really I don't know the answer to that. Make an art installation. Yeah. Yeah, an art installation. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Hung up. Oh, so I was wondering that the error sample the reader is probably the never didn't pass it. So yeah, yeah. So, so I was wondering is that the table those uh those descriptive analysis and what is the These are all uh chi squared analyses. I was wondering that if you have a chance to include that in the regression analysis and multivariate analysis, so I'll just want to have a type of it. Yeah, we um I mean, a biostatistician worked on this data for a long time, but the problem is when you're doing these regression analysis, you end up with, you could end up with a lot of variables and we only had 14 positive samples total. And so it kind of makes them results, the, the error bars would be so huge on them that like they, that we couldn't really find anything um, when we did regression analysis that would be uh, relevant. I was so like so you are so you I think by remember correctly that you are uh, you had a similar situation to kind of unspecified but specified it as an official thing. So if you maybe you have a small sample, I think that just to you know two variables like that. Mm -hmm. But the six month variable I think it to me uh, it might be adequate, you know, I had to have the I'm happy to work with you on this and we could reanalyze it because I keep saying, you know, we have to put it, but it's confounded. Could you look at it with regard to like the presence of HEPA filter? You know, the, the because the HEPA filters were prioritized, they weren't evenly distributed. Um, but if you want to help, if you want to sit down and look at this data with me, I'm happy to <laughs> further, further think about it. Yeah.
Yes. So like uh, probably thanks to Hamed who has done a lot of this research while I was on maternity leaves, plural. Yes, Bob? Say again. The excretory limb of the respirator of the ventilator. Okay, yeah. Filtration on that that prevents. Yeah, in general, those have filters on them, so it shouldn't be going. It shouldn't be going into the room. Yeah, that that means also. Why? Right. Yeah. And I think that the process of intubation is aerosol generating, but once someone is sedated and intubated, they're probably not generating huge numbers of particles. It's all inside. All inside. It's yeah. It's a closed circuit system. All right.